All right. Today is Monday, the 9th of October. And this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Happy Columbus Day or happy Indigenous Day. Whatever floats your boat doesn't matter to me. So long as you don't mess up with National Donut Day because that's sacred to me. And let's start by this. You know, they talked about peak inflation. Inflation is going to go down. It used to be transitory, and then it became peaking, and then it's no longer peaking. And apparently this inflation is uh, coming back stronger, bigger, and better than before. It's being uh, built back better. Because right now, the prices of gas at the pump are rising higher again. And I know that here it says the AAA national average stands at 3.8 bucks a gallon, but this was a few days ago. The number right now stands at 3.90 cents per gallon. But if you thought this is bad, wait till you see the prices we're paying here in the um, uh, used-to-be-great state of california because uh 3.8 bucks a gallon that's a deal that's a steal actually if you have any gasoline station here in california selling gas at 3.8 bucks a gallon you will see the longest line in history waiting to pump gas from this particular gas station look at the divergence we are paying insane prices at the pump here in my uh, beloved state of california and when we talk about the rate of inflation across the country well the rate of inflation is not going to go down if the largest state in the nation is paying these insane prices at the pump so why is this happening you might have heard uh, excuses such as oh the greedy gasoline station owner or the greedy oil companies or supply shocks or the thing still two years later but in reality this this is the reason why we're paying an arm and a leg at the gas pump in the state of california we've never seen the gap between california and the rest of the country this high while some analysts have pointed to refinery shutdowns contributing to these skyrocketing prices there are other factors at play including california's strict environmental laws requiring special summer and winter gas blends as well as the highest gas taxes in the country, tacking on about $1.40 to every gallon of gas we buy here. That's a lot of money and it's way too expensive. Here's a breakdown of those taxes and fees. For every gallon of gas in California, we pay 54 cents in state excise tax, among the highest in the nation, 18.4 cents in federal excise tax, 23 cents for California's cap and trade program to lower greenhouse gas emissions, 18 cents for the state's low carbon fuel program. Two cents for underground gas storage fees, as well as an average of 3.7% in state and local sales taxes. So maybe a rapid way to take inflation down is for our beloved governor, Kim Jong-un Newsom, to get rid of all of these insane regulations and taxes and fees, and that will do the job. But instead, our dear leader here in the state of California, our beloved governor, decided to do something else. Take a look. Well, check your bank account. The state may have just given you hundreds of dollars. The money is to help people with rising costs from inflation. So who exactly gets it and how much will it be? KKL 9's Christine Lazar is live in North Hollywood with some answers. Hey, Christine. Hi, Amy. Well, when you think of inflation, many people think about these gas prices, which you can see here are well above $6 a gallon. But state officials say these refunds aren't just meant to offset the price of gas, also things like groceries, basically anything that has gone up this past year. And that money may already be in your bank account. $91.95, which is crazy. It won't bring gas prices down, but it could bring your bank balance up. Money that I didn't expect always makes a difference. And look at this guy. He's like, uh, you dummies going to give me free cash? Yeah, I'm taking that. And by the way, later on in the, uh, in the report, they asked the same gentleman, what are you going to do with the money? A few hundred bucks, what are you going to do with it? You know what he said? I'm going to use it to buy gas. So what a genius way to fight inflation. Buy more inflation. Hey folks, here's free money for you. Go ahead and increase the demand at the pump and push these prices higher and higher and higher. And maybe later on, we'll give you another stimmy and another one. And another one and keep chasing these prices higher and higher and higher but it's not just the state of california that is contributing to the rise in the rate of inflation across the nation it is also something else that happened last week and it builds on on this uh, oil war that we're seeing in the global stage and last week we got a major development with massive ramifications to come and this development happens to be the strike back by opic plus so let's talk about it and here it is in focus tonight
There will be blood as OPIC Plus strikes back. What are we talking about here? Let's back up for a minute and set the stage. By now, you might be already aware that this inflation has been really good for energy companies, be it domestically or internationally, as we see the prices of commodities that they sell moving higher and higher and higher. And of course, when we talk about crude oil, the most important country that comes to mind is Saudi Arabia. This inflation has been really good for Saudi Arabia. The earnings for that country has been surging significantly higher so far this year. It slowed down a bit, but needless to say, this inflation has been really good for Saudi Arabia. While we see certain economies that happen to be net energy importers, such as as European nations already dipping into a recession, countries like Saudi Arabia that happen to be a net energy exporter experienced an economic boom instead. Even the IMF said earlier this year that high oil prices will drive Saudi Arabia's economic growth to outpace the United States this year. And of course, who predicted all of this and decided to buy the KSA ETF, the Saudi Arabian ETF? Yep, the guy you're listening to right now. Take a look. And here is the last international market that I bought with the ticker KSA. This is for the Saudi Arabian market and it gives you exposure to Aramco. We know that energy prices are rising higher. A giant oil company with the lowest cost to produce such as Aramco will benefit tremendously from the rise in commodity prices. Once again, higher inflation is very good for energy prices and this is one way to get exposure to one of the top beneficiaries of the rise in energy prices. And here's the update since that call the ticker KSA, which is the Saudi Arabian ETF, surged by almost 50% before moving down again. And of course, you don't need to be an expert in charting to realize that perhaps this chart doesn't look as good as it used to be before because instead of a reverse head and shoulder formation, it now has an actual head and shoulder formation, indicating that in all likelihood the top is already in. And what caused the ticker KSA to underperform as of late? The answer is the drop in energy prices. Why did energy prices move down? The answer is, number one, the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the world, is tightening the monetary policy. They have enabled this inflation by being too loose on the monetary policy and initiating the largest tsunami of liquidity in human history. And after inflation got out of hand, the Federal Reserve decided to tighten the monetary policy aggressively. And this tightening reduces the demand in the economy. As interest rates move higher, buying things becomes more expensive. And thus, the demand goes down. And as a result, we see energy prices also going down. Another factor that perhaps not as important as the tightening of the monetary policy that pushed the prices of oil down happens to be the monstrous releases from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, also known as the SPR by the Joey B administration. No president in history have depleted the SPR more than Joe Biden, and it was done to push energy prices down. Now at the time, Saudi Arabia had two choices either to retaliate right away and go tit for tat against the United States or wait until the US depletes its own SPR to critical levels and when they're ready to replenish those reserves in the SPR, meaning when the American government is ready to buy barrels to replenish the SPR, that is the moment to strike back when the iron is hot. And this is exactly what Saudi Arabia and OPEC Plus did last week by cutting about 2 million barrels per day from the global output. Immediately, the Joy B administration came out and said that they are disappointed by the decision by OPEC Plus, and they decided to release their BlackRock propagandist, Brian Deese, to go on TV and say this. Brian, what was your reaction to the news this morning? Well, we were disappointed uh, that uh, OPEC uh, made this decision. Uh, as the president mentioned, we think it's unnecessary if you look at the global environment where supply continues to be the predominant challenge. We've been working for some time to take action and encourage action globally to uh, make sure that supply actually matches demand. But so far, saying that hey, the decision by OPEC Plus is disappointing, that is one thing, but it is entirely a different thing. We heard the subsequent reaction, which is basically accusing Saudi Arabia of choosing Russia's side. So we know that the tensions between the two countries are brewing and getting hotter and hotter and hotter by the day. So what would be the reaction by the Joy B administration at this point? How are they going to retaliate against Saudi Arabia? Is it going to be, number one, depleting the SPR even more? Well, it appears that the administration is going this way of depleting more and more barrels from the SPR. And we know that this is not going to work because the SPR has a certain capacity. So it is a band-aid. It is not a permanent solution to this problem. So what is it going to be? 
Is it going to be begging oil companies to produce more, to increase the production here in the United States? Well, you have all of these oil companies who say, wait a minute here, the administration have been hostile against us with the green energy agenda. They want to make us obsolete. They're hitting us with taxes, insane taxes, insane regulations. And on top of that, they also accused us of creating inflation by being too greedy. So our oil companies right now are going to say, okay, you know what? We're going to forego high oil prices and all of these revenues and beautiful balance sheets that we're having right now to please the Joey B administration that was hostile to us to begin with? No thank you. So that's a no-go. What else? How about option number three, which is begging Iran or perhaps Venezuela to produce more? The problem is both Iran and Venezuela are members of OPEC and it appears that Venezuela is not really interested in such a deal because they don't trust the United States. So how will the retaliation take place? Well, it's going to be way uglier than just increasing supply and going tit for tat against Saudi Arabia. Take a look. The White House is retraining its focus on major oil companies, saying they're gouging consumers and profiting from it. But White House allies in Congress want more concrete action to retaliate against Saudi Arabia and force officials they see as pro-Saudi to defend their actions. Earlier today, I spoke with progressive Congressman Ro Khanna, who's been a vocal critic of the OPEC decision and the administration's response. He said he wants Brett McGurk, head of Middle East policy, to testify in Congress on why McGurk pushed for President Biden to visit the kingdom, which Khanna says cabinet members objected to. He also wants the administration to ban the export of gasoline, telling me it's not just something they should study and consider. They need to be demanding the Saudis reverse the decision. Sources tell me the Biden administration has for months been weighing a ban on export of refined products, something officials broached yet again with energy executives just once one week ago in a meeting. Companies have argued the disruption would cause further increases to prices, but I'm told a ban remains under consideration. On Capitol Hill, two specific bills could gain new traction with bipartisan support. One is called NOPEC. It would remove antitrust immunity from foreign nations that take part in OPEC. That passed Senate committee 17 to 4 with both parties' support. Another bill released by three Democrats yesterday would remove 5,000 troops from Saudi Arabia and the UAE and remove defense systems, too, in the wake of the decision. That being said, both chambers of Congress are out of session right now ahead of the midterm, so nothing is likely on that front between now and when they return. We'll see what the White House can do next. And as the relationship between the two countries sour, the accusations of being on Russia's side is getting louder and louder and louder by the White House against Saudi Arabia, to the point of accusing this decision by OPEC Plus of being coordinated by Saudi and Russia together. And I don't know if you caught it or not, but there was a heated moment last week in the OPEC Plus conference when a reporter from Reuters suggested that to the Saudi prince who happens to be the energy minister. Take a look. Alex Lawler from Reuters News Agency. Um, I had two questions. The so, first is... But no, 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 Alex, I have to talk to you about... So you have got it wrong. Okay. <laughs> and you have got it wrong twice. Before I ask a question, I... And you will get it three, the third time if you... You know, you did... Uh, as Reuters did not do a proper job. You talked about Russia doing this and that. And actually, the day that your story came out, no one from Russia talked to me, nor I talked to anybody from Russia. You repeated that again with another tale of a story prior to that, that Saudi and Russia, blah, 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 are congregating around a hundred dollar price. That is not true. We, and I spent 20 minutes from one of your respected mem uh, members of uh, your peer in Dubai, <coughs> explaining to her or actually 25 minutes, why we don't go as Saudi Arabia for price targeting. And that 25 minutes went in vain, and I really don't like that. I acted in a very respectful way, emanating from respecting the agency, and I think, but you elected, you elected to choose a phantom Saudi source. Saucy source, if I can do it as British as I could. <laughs> But if you have questions, direct it to others, but not me. I'm not talking to Reuters. Until you respect the source, which is the energy minister, on behalf of the Saudi government. Okay, thank you. I won't ask So the you will ask the questions to any of my colleagues. And the accusation doesn't stop here. It's not about 
coordinating with Russia or siding with Russia. There's also the accusations by the West against Saudi Arabia of sabotaging central banks' work against inflation. Because all of this fight so far by central banks, be it the Fed or the ECB or the BOE, all of these central banks have been raising interest rates significantly and in a rapid pace. But now that we're seeing the supply cut pushing oil prices higher, these central banks have to do more in pushing inflation down because it's a battle between supply and demand. You see, when central banks, let's say the Fed, raises interest rates significantly higher, what are they doing? They're taking demand down. By taking demand down, they're hoping that energy prices will go down. But then when you have a production cut by OPEC, that reduces the supply to meet demand or even go below demand, and thus maintaining energy prices to remain high. And how does OPEC Plus respond to this kind of accusation that they're now sabotaging the work of central banks, causing things to become more expensive, and risking a global recession as central banks have to do more in tackling inflation now? Well, here's the response from OPEC Plus. Take a look. We have an open door. I'm waiting for someone to knock on that door. That's all I can say. And you're still not getting anyone knocking on that door because a lot of folks would say that by this action you, by these cuts you, you, you are ask, endangering global energy markets you are endangering the global economy what's the response there sirs if you permit me Royal Highness, we are not endangering the energy markets we are providing security stability to the energy markets at a price uh, everything has a price energy security has a price as well. So you have all of these oil producing nations saying, hey, wait a minute here. You got the West, the United States and European nations chasing the green energy dreams and fantasies. What does that mean? In a nutshell, it means they want our source of revenue to become obsolete. This is what these OPEC plus countries, these oil producing nations are thinking. You're going for the green energy. You want to reduce the demand for oil, meaning you want to sign a death warrant against oil at some point, And we're supposed to lower prices for you until you get to the transition to green energy. We have to suffer until that happens. And we have to suffer after that happens? No thanks. OPEC Plus says, we're not doing this. We're going to keep oil prices higher for as long as it takes. And the risk here is, if it becomes a tit-for-tat oil war, specifically between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Now, in the past, the United States had a lot of influence in Saudi Arabia. They can drive the energy policy using that influence. But as of late, this influence has become really, really weak. To begin with, the trading relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States of America are not really that good. There used to be a certain level of dependency. Saudi used to import a lot of products from the United States, and the U.S. used to import a lot of oil products from Saudi Arabia. Not anymore. Matter of fact... As of late, Mexico and Russia have surpassed Saudi Arabia as the largest oil exporters to the United States. This was before the war, of course. Now Russia doesn't even exist. And who happens to be the largest importer of Saudi oil? Well, it is certainly not the United States. It is actually China. So slowly but surely, as of late, Saudi Arabia has been moving away from the United States and closer to other nations. For example, Saudi Arabia's holdings in U.S. treasuries have been falling dramatically as of late. Matter of fact, Saudi reduced 36.7% of its holdings of U.S. treasury securities in two years. And on top of that, Saudi is no longer buying bonds for their currency reserve account. And where did Saudi Arabia shift to instead? The answer is, how about Russia? Before the war, Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund invested $2 billion in Russia. Saudi continues to import fuel oil from Russia. And on top of that, we now have discussions about a rupee real trade between India and Saudi Arabia. Not to mention talks about a trade of oil products using the Chinese yuan. And if that happens, say goodbye to the petrodollar. But now, of course, you have a bunch of amateurs, such as the Daily B, Beast, which is a publication of yellow journalism with ties to the uh, intelligence apparatus of Uranus. And they say that Russia and OPEC are driving U.S. and China into an unlikely partnership. Or really? As to imply that the relationship is getting better between the United States and China. You mean China, who we just banned chips from? Is that who we're talking about? Because believe it or not, Saudi Aramco did not raise the price for its main oil grade for Asia. They're not raising prices for China or any of their Asian customers. The production cuts don't even touch China or Asian consumers of Aramco's oil. But the Daily Beast, of course, they're a bunch of amateur. They couldn't even bother doing their own research, as usual, of course. So this whole thinking about all oh, OPEC Plus might backtrack the decision because China will add more pressure on Saudi Arabia and other OPEC Plus countries, not really. 
not happening. So where does that leave us? Because this tit-for-tat war, this oil war, will intensify in the days to come, in the weeks to come, in the months to come, what are the ramifications for the entirety of the economy, for the stock market, and for the Fed's policy, most importantly? We have three different challengers here. Number one, Jerome Powell of the Federal Reserve. Number two, Joe Biden of the White House. Number three, the Saudi oil minister from OPEC+. Plus. These men are now colliding against each other. And as they collide, more and more risk will be borne in the economy, which will lead to a topic that we talked about in yesterday's video, the financial accident. Why do we say that? What is Jerome Powell's objective here? What is he looking for? Well, he wants to reduce inflation. In other words, he wants lower oil prices. How is he going to achieve this goal? The answer is by reducing demand by increasing interest rates higher. Now, what about the Joy B administration? What is the objective here? It's the same as the Fed, lower oil prices because they have an election coming. You know the deal. But what is the method here? The answer is they have no clue, not us. They have no clue. Depleting the SBR is not an option anymore. Begging Venezuela and Iran, that's not a choice anymore. Is it going to be begging domestic oil companies, giving them incentives to produce more? We'll see. Now, what is the objective of the Saudi oil minister? The answer is higher oil prices. That means more revenue for Saudi Arabia. And how is he going to achieve this objective? The answer is by cutting production. Now you might say, hey Maverick, what do I care about all of this? Why is this risky? Why is this going to lead to a financial collapse? Here's why. We know before the Fed's tightening cycle started that inflation was way too high, interest rates were way too low, the recession risk was here but it was not significant, and oil supplies were a little below demand. And then the Fed started to increase interest rates higher to tackle inflation down. And as they raise interest rates higher, what happens? Inflation goes down, but then the recession risk also moves slightly higher. Something else also happens. Remember, when the Fed raises rates, the objective is to crush demand. Crushing demand meaning lower oil prices. As inflation goes down, oil prices also go down. So then what happens? Well, OPEC Plus and Saudi Arabia have to respond by cutting production. And when they cut supplies, what happens? Inflation moves higher again. And that diminishes all of the work that the Fed has been doing by increasing interest rates year to date. So the Fed has to fight back. And by fighting back, they increase interest rates even higher. And when they do that, watch what happens. Inflation goes down, but the recession risk moves higher. Higher interest rates, meaning something is going to blow up, more tightening in the economy, equals more probability of a recession happening. And the severity of the recession continues to move higher and higher and higher. And here's where it gets really dangerous. After doing this, oil prices will go down again. What if OPEC Plus and the Saudis decide to cut the supply even more? Are we going this tit-for-tat between OPEC Plus and the Fed. OPEC Plus reduces supplies. The Fed responds by increasing their interest rates higher to crush demand and push oil prices down. If this game continues, inflation might actually stick at a higher level, but we might see the recession risk exploding significantly higher. Because if they thought before that tackling inflation would take interest rates to 5%, now they have to go north of that. They have to go 6, 7, 8%. And as interest rates continue to go higher, the recession risk continues to move higher. And so is the possibility of a financial accident. That also moves higher. You see how dangerous this game is if the tit-for-tat continues? And I don't see these two parties coming together at some point. It wouldn't make sense at all. The Fed wants much lower oil prices, and they want to do it by increasing interest rates higher. That's the only tool they got for now. The Joe Biden administration, yes, they overlap with the Fed. They want lower oil prices, but they don't want the Fed to continue to increase interest rates higher and higher to do it because this increases the odds of a recession and higher unemployment in the economy. The administration doesn't want that, obviously. And then you have on the other side OPEC Plus and Saudi Arabia. They're also looking for their own economies and they want higher oil prices. And they're going to do that as long as it needs to be done by reducing supplies to keep a floor underneath oil prices. Think of it as a put. An OPEC plus put. Oil is not allowed to go under a number. Whatever that number is, 85, 80 bucks a gallon, who knows. But there is an OPEC plus put. And it's not only that. Oil has many other tailwinds that could surge oil prices back above 100 easily, even to 120 easily. So all of this talk about, all oh, the Fed has to pivot because they've done enough so far, you have absolutely no f***ing clue what you're talking about. If the Fed pauses right now or pivots to cutting rates, crude oil futures will explode to at least 150 bucks 
a barrel. Because on top of OPEC Plus and the tit for tat, other tailwinds include the upcoming price cap on Russian oil. That could reduce the supply by an additional 3 million barrels. Would you like to see 200 bucks a barrel? You might see that soon. And on top of that, it's not just what's going on with oil. When we talk about the energy market, it's all over the place. It's heating oil. It's natural gas and specifically natural gas. And it is a much bigger crisis over in Europe. Now that we know that oil supplies will be restrained and we have a put that will keep oil prices higher for longer, combine that with erasing even the possibility of restoring Russian gas to the European continent. This winter will be absolutely brutal. Between oil prices moving higher and natural gas prices exploding higher, I don't see good things happening to the global economy. And it's happening in a dangerous way. It's happening in a geopolitical fashion with countries pinning their heads against each other. An economic war spreading by the day. And on Friday, perhaps we got a confirmation from Reuters that it was indeed the United States behind blowing up Nord Stream. And the thinking here is, if Russian gas is not flowing to Europe anyways, might as well cut it for good and have them rely on US LNG. But be careful of making that suggestion openly because you got your uh, Columbia professor, Jeffrey Sachs. I don't know if you've seen this or not. It's absolutely hilarious. He went over in Bloomberg and he suggested the obvious that the United States is indeed behind blowing up Nord Stream. And watch the reaction of our beloved free media. Take a look. Now, uh, to make it uh, definitive, the destruction of uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, which I, I would bet was a U.S. action, perhaps U.S. and, and Poland. Uh, this is uh, hey, Jeff, speculation. Jeff, we got to stop there. That's, a, that's a quite a statement as well. They immediately went, blah, 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 what were you talking about here? Come on. You can't say that on TV. We got a narrative to sell here. You can't say that. We got to follow the dear leader. Uh, the order is from the state. You can't go off script, Professor Sachs. You can't have people get the idea that we might be the bad guy here. God forbid. What do you think this is, Professor Sack? You think you can just say whatever you want? You think this is America? What's wrong with you? And of course, they got the hashtag Nord Stream did not kill itself. Very clever. But it shows that this is getting out of control. This energy crisis stemming from natural gas or crude oil, it doesn't matter. It's getting riskier and riskier by the day. It is about to cripple economies and pin nations against each other, which becomes a geopolitical problem. And then what? Things could get out of hand really quickly. For example, the economy minister in Germany suggested that the United States and other friendly gas suppliers are actually doing price gouging and taking advantage of Germany by charging astronomical prices. Unfortunately for the Germans, they got no other options now. You gotta buy from the United States. You can't go back to Russia and Nord Stream. Whoops, did I just reveal the reason behind blowing up the pipelines? I don't know. But anyways, even here in the United States, as the demand for natural gas, we're talking about US natural gas, increases because Germany now has no other alternative by competing on buying United States natural gas, and many other countries will do the same, we have more demand for domestic natural gas. In other words, what is that going to mean for you and me? It means we're going to pay more, baby. All of these utility bills... They're going to go higher and higher and higher. The moral of the story is, in this uh, beautiful nighttime bed story called The Oil Wars, is um, inflation is not going to go down, folks, and the Fed will have to be even more aggressive. The pivot is coming, but the pivot will be for a more aggressive Fed. And you know what that entails. More recession risk, a more risk of something blowing up. So buckle up. And grab as much popcorn as you need, because the action is about to heat up significantly. And with that lovely story out of the way, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today, and here we go! The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red down by 93.91 points or a decline of 0.32%. The Nasdaq down by 110.30 points or a decline of 1.04%. The S&P down by 27.27 points or a decline of 0.75%. What about the sector's performances today? Pathetic across the board. We're not giving medals even to the sectors that managed to close in the green because they barely closed in the green. And the laggards today were led by energy, technology, and REITs. Now remember, today was a low volume kind of day, the bond market was off, so you can't take anything that happened today seriously. But here it is, the advance to decline ratios, NYC, 37% advancing versus 61% declining. The NASDAQ, 35% advancing versus 62% declining. A look at the new 52 week lows on the NASDAQ. 409 new lows in the NASDAQ today alone. 
Unbelievable. On to commodities, what's going on here? Again, you can't take the action seriously today because it was a low volume kind of day, but all in all, commodities were down. Energy commodities were muted to the downside. The gasoline RBOP, for example, lost almost 3% today. Natural gas were down by about 3% also. Now we'll see what happens when the volume is resumed tomorrow. But the event that will move the commodities market along with the stock market is the upcoming CPI reading. If it comes out too hot, indicating that the Fed will be more aggressive, you're going to see a sell-off in commodities because the dollar is going to shoot up higher. But if the CPI comes out tame, whatever that means, the dollar could actually cool down and this will initiate a rally in commodities. But for now, softs were pretty much on the downside across the board with exception of cotton, scoring gains of about four and three quarters of a percent today. When it comes to metals, all down with exception of copper, with gains of about one and a half percent. On the other hand, gold is down, platinum is down, palladium is down, and silver is down big, about three percent. Lots of profit taking from silver. We got massive gains in the last week or so, but now as the dollar continues to move higher, we see traders taking profits and running away. When it comes to meats, down across the board for live and feeder cattle futures, feeder cattle was down a little over 1.5%. On the other hand, lean hogs is rebounding higher, gaining a little over 2.5% for the day. But the story was wheat futures in grains shooting up higher with gains of about seven percent for the day yeah inflation is going down right and the reason is the war is escalating again today we got massive bombing across ukraine by russia and more escalation in the war means perhaps more restraints and supplies of wheat and other commodities which means inflation will push its way higher and higher and higher Moving on to the big casino, the options market. What's going on here? The volume is tamed today. It's not a surprise. Today's Columbus Day slash National Indigenous Day. So the expectations are the volume will be down and the market all in all did not go one way or the other. Yes, we got losses, but this is due to the market's bias because we don't have buyers. The buyers are gone. They got stung over and over and over again and they're now waiting for something a catalyst something they can hang their hats on could it be the cpi we'll see if i was a bull i wouldn't bet much in the cpi for help but for now the volume is down yet leading the pack the hottest table by far in the casino today was tesla the souffle with around 1.5 million contracts traded today look at this about 58 percent of those were calls they're looking for a rebound here in tesla at number two apple with around 800,000 contracts about 52 percent of those were calls at number three amd with around 700,000 contracts about 54 percent of those were calls a lot of folks love amd and they're buying the dip by buying calls hoping for a rebound and here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today we start with the ticker xlp this is the etf for consumer staples and these happen to be some of the best names left in the stock market because they hold a lot better under inflation but they also hold a lot better under a recession however by the end of the bear market meaning the epic finale leg the crash we see utilities and consumer staples being sold and we've seen this back in 2008 we've seen this back in the 2000 the aftermath of the dot-com bubble these names were the last ones to go and here we have somebody betting that this process is underway and they bought the 60 bucks puts for the expiration date November 18th, with expectations that the XLP could go down and lose more than 10% of its value by then, they paid around 45 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $900,000. What about the ticker FXI? This is for the Chinese ETF. Somebody sees a rebound coming here. They bought the 27 calls for the expiration date, October 28th, with expectations that the FXI could move higher and rebound. By more than five and a half percent by then they paid around 40 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around eight hundred thousand dollars what about the ticker fez the fez this is the bullish leverage index for the xlp excuse me xlf for financials in other words if financials bank stocks go higher fez appreciates three times that amount and why are they bidding in favor of the fez the answer is upcoming banks earnings. These traders believe that once we get the earnings from JP Morgan and Bank of America and etc etc, the market will love them. We will see gains in the XLF, we will see the FEZ appreciating significantly. So they bought the 35 calls for the expiration date, December 16th, with expectations that the FEZ could move higher and gain more than 12% by then. They paid around 45 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending almost eight hundred thousand dollars next what about the ticker amat for applied materials chips are getting crushed 
and somebody sees more pain to come for this name. They bought the 65 puts for the expiration date, December 16th, with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 18% of its value by then. They paid around 2 bucks and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $2.3 million. And then what about the ticker QQQ for the NASDAQ? Somebody sees more pain to come here. They bought the 235 puts for the expiration date, November 4th, with expectations that the Qs could go down and lose more than 12% of its value by then. They paid around one buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around 1.7 million dollars. On to the heat map. What's going on here? Mostly in the red, but we have few exceptions here. The obvious one that sticks out is Merck. Merck was the top gainer for the day. Now, this is a name that is considered value, quote-unquote, and it has been underperforming the market in 2020, 2021, as the majority of stocks gained significant value. This stock remained in consolidation didn't do anything at all and now we see it outperforming the stock market by a lot another notable activity is the fact that apple outperformed other big cap technology stocks microsoft was down over two percent apple was actually in the green so is this a beginning sign of perhaps that we're seeing some dip buyers showing up again and they're going with the safe quote-unquote name first, dipping their toes a little bit by buying some apple. I'm just reading the tea leaves for you. The CPI could sting them again, but in the meantime, can they push the market a little higher as they buy the dip before the CPI? We'll see. And another notable finding is the outperformance by defense contractors, LMT, Lockheed Martin, NOC, Northrop Grumman, BA, Boeing, all outperforming on a nuclear war optimism. Another interesting finding is the rebound in consumer staples, be it in Kraft Heinz, names like Kroger or Hershey's or General Mills or Kellogg's. All of these names have been getting hammered as of late, but investors see value in these dips because these names tend to fare better under inflation and also under a recession. Now, let's talk about some corporate news. And we start with, uh, since we've been talking about OPEC Plus and the green energy lunacy. Well, here it is. Revion is recalling 13,000 EVs over loose fasteners that could affect steering. Let me tell you something here. And it's not just against EVs, but even those modern vehicles, let's say 2012 and above, they got rid of the mechanical steering and now you have electric steering. And I'm sorry, but this has no soul behind it at all. There is no soul behind the steering wheel. It makes a world of difference when you drive a mechanical steering wheel like I have in my uh, beater Honda versus when you drive a soulless car with electric steering. And now we have all of these electric vehicles. Wait till the steering wheel starts to malfunction. Wait till the Russians hack into your souffle's Teslas and drive them off a cliff. But anyways, also Ford is getting a dig here. This went viral on YouTube. Apparently the new Ford pickup truck, Lightning, the electric pickup, well, it's um... Uh, I don't know how to say this uh, without offending anybody, but it appears to be a pickup in panties. Once the battery goes low, it cannot tow shit. So yeah, this green energy slash EV lunacy, it might work someday, but until we get there, can we please keep the hybrid vehicles? They were beautiful. You use a little bit of gas, a little bit of battery, but no, they're so stubborn. They're all in in this lunacy. They want the shift to happen now rapidly immediately and oh by the way we want uh lower oil prices and natural gas prices on top of that we want our cake and eat it too pretty please what else how about paypal and you know what i'm glad the paypal stock has crashed because this company keeps censoring folks left and right anything they don't like anything that goes off the script off the official dear leader dear government script they censor and ban right away and today we got stunning news that they're not going to just stop at that banning folks canceling your accounts today they told users they will find them 2500 bucks for misinformation quote unquote and then they backtracked immediately because you know this is not north korea i don't know maybe it is maybe we're going that way in the meantime let's go over the heat map for the et what do we see here? Mostly in the red, even commodities are underperforming. Nothing is moving higher here, few exceptions. You got the XME outperforming for materials, but that's about it. It is inverse indices, it is the UVXY, we talked about the VIX and the possibility of the VIX going much higher. And now we see folks spitting on the UVXY. My advice is be careful because this resets every single day. So you could be up 3% today. You could be down 10% tomorrow, even though the VIX is pretty much static, didn't move at all. So your timing has to be immaculate in trading the UVXY. You can buy it 
buy the actual ETF and hold it for a little while if you're confident that the VIX is about to explode. But with these leverage indices, folks, always be closing. Always be closing. Otherwise, you might lose all your gains. You end up being homeless. You lose your wife. You lose the kids. You lose the dogs. You know the deal. Let's move on to charts. And uh, sorry for the disappointment because nothing happened today. Nothing important, technically speaking, happened today. But we can still find something to talk about, something to cover, some clues here and there of what's about to come. We start with SPY, S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Today, we got to move down. We now know that the June bottom is now resistance once again because the SPY is trading below the June bottom. It is bumping its head against the June bottom now resistance over and over and over again. Now you could read this as failure. The chart is not capable of cracking above the June bottom once again making it into support but the bulls will look at it as wait a minute here today was low volume it's the holiday and the chart is just forming a bull flag pattern below the june bottom sooner or later it's going to pop above it i say nothing significant will happen until we get the cpi out of the way but what does this mean psychologically speaking what does the bull pattern means to begin with, it means you had an initial wave of buying, a surge of volume, and it popped the chart higher. And then the chart is consolidating, asking for another batch of buyers. If the buyers show up, the bull flag plays out, and we see another leg higher. If the buyers don't show up, the bull flag fails. That's all there is. So the question here is, are the buyers about to show up? What would make them show up? The answer is the CPI. That's all there is. If the CPI comes out cooler than expectations, or the buyers will show up. But if the consensus is right, the CPI will be another ugly reading showing that inflation is sticking and perhaps prompting more aggressive Fed action. You will see the bull flag failing because the buyers never showed up. On to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500. What do we see here? It is now retesting my June bottom. I was a little conservative when I picked 3600 and it's now being retested as we speak. The RSI is weakening once again. These are the momentum indicators. The MACD is about to cross, producing negative impressions in the histogram, indicating the attempt at creating bullish momentum has failed. And now we go back to bearish momentum, also known as negative momentum. If that is the case, 3600 will not hold, and we will see a cascading effect once that broken. For now, the bulls can hang their hats on the fact that 3600 is not broken. Maybe the CPI will come out favorable. We see another re band from or around 3600. You can hope all you want, but for now, the bears have the advantage. The cues, what's going on here? Similar pattern. We got a little bit of a rebound off the lows and then consolidation. The negative divergence on the RSI persists. And while it is a bull flag pattern, I have the caution sign right next to it because it might not play out. If the buyers don't show up, it's not going to play out. We're going to go down again. And mind you, the cues is trading way below the June bottom as we speak. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract. Still negative divergence we have a confirmation in the macd that we have negative divergence for now negative momentum i should say the support of 11,058 and a half is well it's gone for now not once but twice can they get a rebound around this neighborhood yes they can under low volume if some buyers do show up tomorrow we could see another rebound higher another attempt it's not going to be a significant one but at the end of the day if the cpi comes out and says hey inflation is not going down fed is about to be more aggressive guess what the buyers never showed up to begin with, but now the sellers are going to show up. And we will see a big major leg down. What about the IWM? 30 minutes chart, similar pattern. It bumped its head against the resistance at around 168.90. Did not make it, but it is consolidating in a bull flag pattern. Will the buyers show up? If they do, higher we go. 168.90 becomes support. If they don't, we go down to revisit 164.91 as support. The Dixie, the dollar index, what's going on here? The trend remains intact, and yesterday we talked about different outlooks for the dollar from a four hours perspective. But on the daily chart right now, what do we see here? Well, we got three resistance levels. Number one at 111.58. That's already beaten. And then we have resistance number two at around 113. The chart is already trading above that at the time of the recording of this video. And then we have the ultimate resistance at around 114.7. If the chart cracks above that, we will see another explosive move in the dollar as it makes higher highs. But it's not going to be easy. The bulls, of course, are hoping for a double top at around 114. 
13.7. On to gold. What's going on here in the daily chart? We talked about the bull flag not playing out if the dollar continues to move higher. And we now know that the bull flag is not going to play out because the chart lost two important support levels. Number one, 1,685. Number two, 1,671. They're both gone. No bull flag. It's over. And that supports a rally in the dollar at least until the CPI comes out. Here's crude oil. What's going on here in Brent, a daily chart? It got to the resistance at around 98, and we talked about the explosion that's about to happen if the chart cracks above the sloping line of resistance. We got the explosive move. It was worth about 11.5%, but it is now facing resistance at around 98. Now, that doesn't mean that the rally is over, but it means that it's now watching for the dollar. We have profit taking before the CPI because the dollar is going to move significantly one way or the other after we get the CPI. Here's the 10-year yield, the daily chart. What's going on here? We did confirm the reversal because the chart closed on a daily basis above the top of the reversal candle. We have another one, the top one, the most important one. And as we talked with the dollar chart, if this chart cracks above the top and closes above the top for the day, we're going to see an explosive move to the upside. But the bulls are hoping for a double top. We'll see if that happens or not. It all depends on the CPI. Moving on to the TLT, this time around a 30 minutes chart because we look at the weekly all the time. We have little updates day to day. So let's look at the 30. We have a curve pattern, a bearish curve pattern indicating lower lows. Now we'll give you five seconds to figure it out here. If you can spot the pattern, what happens? at the end of these bearish curve patterns. Well, here it is. Every time we see these patterns, we see short covering. The shorts book profits and we see a pop in the TLT. This time around, we did not see a pop. And this means one of two things. Number one, the shorts don't want to cover. The shorts are highly confident that the TLT will go lower. That's number one. Number two, and this is probably it, given the fact that today was a holiday and bond trading was pretty much halted, is we're not seeing the reaction because... It was a holiday, so the shorts did not even get the chance to cover. And in all likelihood, you're going to see some short covering before the CPI, but the majority of it, if it happens to begin with, will be after the CPI. Here's the VIX 4 hours chart. What's going on here? We have a gap higher, but the chart could not make it above 33. It is attempting over and over and over and over again to crack above 33, but 33 is now coinciding with the June bottom in the SPY. And the June bottom remains resilient. A lot of folks don't want to lose the June bottom and they're doing everything they can to keep the chart holding onto the June bottom. The CPI will seal the deal here. If the June bottom is lost, you will see the VIX, all of that energy being released to the upside and 33 will be way far behind. Another way to look at the VIX is from a monthly perspective. What do we see here? We have a curve pattern, a bullish curve pattern indicating that this could lead to an explosion in the VIX, another big leg higher. Last time we saw this was in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. So could this be it? Could it happen again? This is what we're watching for. What about Apple daily chart? What's going on here? It is holding onto the support at around 138.79, but the weakness is evident here. There's very little volume and the volume only moves higher on selling days. We have a failure in the MACD to cross and to produce positive momentum. The RSI remains subdued. In all likelihood, if 138.79 is lost, down we go to the June bottom, and in all likelihood, it's not going to hold. Tesla, an hourly chart. What's going on here? The bear flag pattern continues. Is it oversold enough for the bear flag to be canceled and we see a rebound higher? Possibly, because the chart went all the way down, but not quite, to the support of 217.88. Is it good enough? I would say yes, it could. Depending on the day, we could see some short covering before the CPI. We could see the chart rebounding higher in an attempt at 233.33 once again. But you'll know that you're going to short again if the support of 217.88 is lost for good meaning a daily close below the number. And lastly, Bitcoin, Tulips, what's going on here? The double top pushed it down again below 20,000. But is it a sign to short? Is it a sign to buy? My answer is not really. Because it is back to the consolidation zone. There is no resolution here. The chart attempts over and over and over again to crack above 20,000. It doesn't happen. And it goes back to the launching pad once again. Maybe under better conditions, it's going to make it above 20,000. Maybe if more buyers show up, it could make it above 20,000. But for now, do you short it? My answer is not until it breaks 
the lower edge of this consolidation range, which happens to be 18,000. If it cracks below 18,000, next stop is 15,000, and that would be good enough for a trade. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the small business index, and most importantly, we have the New York Fed five year inflation expectations. This could be a teaser for the PPI and the CPI on Wednesday and Thursday. But we also have another zombie from the Fed, this time around from Cleveland, Loretta Mister, speaking to some of her sponsors at the Economic Club of New York. And with that, folks, I'm done here. I hope you find the video informative. And if you did, press the like button, subscribe, leave a comment. You know the story. But this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, no matter what the others promise to do, when it comes to the showdown, they won't be there. <laughs>